It's a pleasure to welcome you back to the news program on 24 Hours Channel. Thank you for sparing a few minutes of your day uh, to accompany us and stay updated with the hottest news and noteworthy events that have taken place alongside 22 Hours Channel. In today's news, we have uh, the following highlights. Twenty-one-year-old Jewel Jean Buskin, or Julie as she will be referred to, lived in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma in 1996. Julie was born and raised in Benton, Arkansas and moved to Oklahoma to study at Oklahoma University. She worked at the university's golf course. Julie was on her way to earning her bachelor's degree in dance. She was an aspiring ballerina, and after college, Julie wanted to open up a studio and teach children to dance. Julie was described as popular and had many friends at school. She was also very talented. Julie spent the evening of December 19th of 1996 with her friend Ryan James at his grandparents' house. Ryan worked with Julie at the golf course. After dinner, they watched a movie. In addition, the two made plans to have lunch the next day. Julie stayed at his grandparents' house until 10 p.m., then left to hang out with some of her other friends. Julie and her friends played Monopoly and exchanged Christmas gifts at one of the friends' houses. Julie said her goodbyes since she was scheduled to move back home the next day. Her semester at college had just ended. Her roommate Megan was also there. Julie promised Megan she would give her a ride to Will Rogers Airport the next morning at 5 o'clock a.m. Julie and Megan decided to pull an all-nighter. They left the friend's house and drove to a restaurant called The Kettle around 2 a.m. When they were done, Julie and Megan drove to the gas station, got some gas and a cappuccino. They returned to their apartment a little after 3 o'clock a.m. to pick up Megan's belongings. A while later, the two left the apartment again and headed towards the airport around 4.30 a.m. It took them 30 minutes to get there. Julie dropped Megan off, and Megan watched Julie drive away from the airport in her Red Eagle Summit. Around 5.30 a.m. at the Dublin West Apartments where Julie lived, many of the residents heard a woman scream in terror. One of the residents made a 911 call to report what they had heard. Yeah, we were just sleeping, and my wife heard a really strange, like really awful scream from our parking lot of our apartment complex. Do you see anything outside? No, I'm kind of afraid to go outside, actually. A few hours later, Ryan James turned up at Julie's apartment for their scheduled lunch date. Julie was nowhere to be found, however. Her car was also missing. Ryan then reported her missing. Not long after that, Julie's parents arrived at her apartment. They drove from Arkansas to help Julie with her move back home. Instead of their daughter, they found policemen who informed them that Julie was missing. Twelve hours after she disappeared, Julie Buskin's body was found on the bank of a lake about 15 miles from her apartment. Her hands were tied behind her back with a pair of shoelaces, and from the waist up, she was in the water. Julie had been shot once execution style. The gunshot wound to the back of her head was a contact wound. There was also some evidence that she had been assaulted. At the lake, investigators found possible evidence in the sand near Julie's body. There were two sets of footprints that went down to the lake, and only one that returned. One set belonged to Julie, and the other police believed belonged to the person who shot her. After examining the footprint and consulting Nike, it was determined that the footprint was consistent with a size 9 men's Nike running shoe, specifically a Nike Air 2 running shoe. About 20 feet from Julie's body, investigators found a crumpled pink leotard with the initials JB on the label. It was Julie's. The leotard had male DNA on it and was subsequently stored to be used later when DNA technology was more advanced. An autopsy confirmed Julie was shot with a single 22 caliber bullet. The specific gun used was quite distinctive, but more on that later. Julie Buskin had quite a lot of friends at the university, 
and investigators set out to interview as many of them as possible. They hoped someone could provide useful information, but that was not the case. There was no one that openly disliked Julie and she didn't have any bad breakups or anything of the sort. Police found Julie's apartment in perfect order. There were no signs of any struggle taking place. They found Julie's car in an apartment complex just one block away from where she lived. Red sand on the floor of the car looked similar to the red sand at the banks of the lake where Julie's body was found. This was seen as rather bizarre by investigators. Why would someone abduct Julie, take her life at the lake, and then drive her car back to almost the exact location where the abduction took place? Frustratingly, there were no foreign hairs, fibers, or prints in the car. Also, no evidence of a struggle taking place. Julie's phone was missing. Investigators obtained her cell phone records to see if it could be useful. The cell phone records indicated that someone made two phone calls after she was not alive anymore. One of the calls was for the weather forecast and the other to a number not in service at the time. Despite the leads and a $70,000 reward, there were no significant breaks and the case went cold for a short while. Then a month after Julie's life was ended, a man called the police. He said that on the night Julie was abducted, he saw a car like hers pull out in front of him and they almost collided. This was near the lake. The witness followed Julie's car for about five miles because he wanted to confront the driver. The driver kept looking at the witness constantly through the rearview mirror and sped off. The witness saw a glimpse of the driver's face and was then tasked with describing him to the investigators. This is the sketch they came up with of the young man that was driving Julie's car away from the lake. He was possibly a college student, possibly Hispanic with long black hair and a muscular build. The composite sketch was broadcast repeatedly by the local media in Oklahoma. No one recognized him. The case went cold for four and a half years. Police received a letter from a female inmate at the Oklahoma County Jail. She said an old acquaintance of hers might have taken Julie's life. He was 23-year-old Dennis Sturmer. Sturmer was a construction worker and had no criminal record. But at the time of the crime, he lived just four blocks away from Julie's apartment and he bore a resemblance to the composite sketch. Sturmer refused to answer any questions and would not provide his DNA sample. Police had to get a court order to collect his DNA. His DNA profile was very, very close to the sample that was taken off the leotard at the crime scene. Very, very close is not a match and he was not considered a suspect anymore. Sturmer's only immediate living male relative was his brother. This had to be him, right? It seemed like the five-year-old cold case was finally going to be solved. But in a twist, his brother's DNA didn't match. Again, the case went cold. Sadly, Julie's parents had to accept the possibility that they might not live long enough to see justice take place. Investigators were determined for that not to happen, and they essentially attempted to collect DNA from every male Julie ever came into contact with. Over 200 men were tested, but no one matched. It seemed like the case might never get solved. Six years after Julie's life was taken, a man by the name of Anthony Castillo Sanchez was arrested for assaulting his girlfriend. After the arrest, Sanchez had to give a DNA sample to law enforcement for testing. Investigators noticed some interesting facts about Sanchez's background. He lived just one mile away from Julie's apartment. One of Sanchez's girlfriends showed investigators her diary for the month in which Julie's life was ended. There was an entry where she stated that Anthony bought her a pair of Nike running shoes and got himself one as well. Sanchez wore a size 9 shoe. If nothing else, it proved Sanchez owned a pair of sneakers the same brand and size as the perpetrator. Interestingly, one of Anthony's exes had a cell phone number that was just one digit off of the number that was dialed on Julie's phone after she was not alive anymore. It was possible that Sanchez tried to call the ex's number from memory, but got one digit wrong. 
Sanchez and his father had an unusual habit of firing 22 caliber guns at the wall inside the house they rented. Investigators collected a bullet from the house. It was determined that the bullet came from the same gun as the one used to shoot Julie. Only six companies made 22 caliber guns with the specific grooves found on the bullets. Finally, in 2004, Anthony Sanchez's DNA was compared to the male DNA found on Julie's leotard. It was, of course, a match. Sanchez was only 18 years old at the time of the crime. It is interesting to think about the fact that if he dialed the correct number on Julie's phone, he would have been caught instantly. Anthony Castillo Sanchez was convicted in 2006. It was decided that he was going to pay for the crime with his life. As recent as March of 2023, Sanchez was still challenging his conviction. He claimed it was his father who committed the crime and not him. His father, Glenn Sanchez, took his own life in April of 2022 and apparently told his girlfriend that it was him all along. But investigators already looked at the possibility that the DNA could actually belong to Glenn Sanchez and it was not the case. The probability of the match being a mistake is 1 in 200 quadrillion for Caucasians, 1 in 20 quintillion for African Americans, and 1 in 94 quadrillion for Southwest Hispanics, according to the court documents. Anthony Sanchez is expected to be executed on September 21st of 2023. Murfreesboro, Tennessee is a place in the United States that saw a very famous battle take place during the Civil War, the Battle of Stones River. In recent years, Murfreesboro has enjoyed substantial growth with many people flocking there thanks to the university. In 1984, a crime took place involving a university student that's still talked about today in Murfreesboro. On May 31st of 1984, a farmer in Murfreesboro, Tennessee made a startling discovery on his way home. The farmer saw some clothing lying in the field and decided to approach. When he did, he noticed the body of a girl was under the clothing. She was only wearing a bra and was covered with two pairs of jeans and a dark jacket. The sleeve of the jacket was wrapped around her neck. Investigators determined the first pair of jeans were hers and the second pair were men's jeans. There were also a pair of underwear found clutched in one of her hands. She was identified as 18-year-old Laura Salmon. Laura was born on October 6, 1965 in Tennessee. At the time, Laura was a local college student. She attended Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And furthermore, she also worked as a cashier at Kroger Grocery Store. The autopsy concluded that Laura lost her life due to blunt force trauma to the head. The weapon appeared to be the rocks found near her body. The blood on those rocks and other material were consistent with her being struck up to 10 times in the head. Also, during the autopsy, the medical examiner found that Laura had been intimate with someone within the last 24 hours or 48 hours prior to her life being taken. There were no injuries or any evidence found that showed it was not consensual. Naturally, one of the biggest leads for investigators was the pair of men's jeans found on top of Laura's body. Investigators found male DNA on the jeans from a different individual than the male that was intimate with Laura. This DNA likely belonged to the perpetrator. Unfortunately, DNA testing was still in its infancy and there was not much else investigators could do with the DNA other than store it. Investigators then focused on creating a timeline of events hoping that it would help them solve the case. Laura started her day by going to her job at the Kroger grocery store. The records showed that she left the store around 1 p.m. After that, she was supposed to go to an appointment at the Middle Tennessee State University to check her grades and meet with some of the office personnel. 
She also had plans to go swimming at her grandmother's house, but never made it there or the university. Investigators found Laura's car near the store, miles away from where her body was found. Investigators were unable to find any fingerprints in the car that did not belong to Laura. But, interestingly, they did find a foreign hair. It was stored alongside the DNA evidence they collected from the pair of jeans. Equally important, investigators found dirt in the wheel wells. The FBI lab determined that they were consistent and that there was a high probability that Laura's car had been on the road right next to the crime scene. This meant that someone took Laura's life and then drove her car back to her place of work. Other than making the investigators believe the perpetrator knew Laura, the lead was not fruitful. Witnesses came forward and placed Laura at a local nightclub on the night before her life was taken. The witnesses said Laura was dancing with an unidentified young man, but investigators could not locate him. Laura's body was found in an area that often served as a lover's lane for high school and college students. They went there to party, have bonfires, etc. The theory then became that Laura met a guy at the nightclub after she finished work and they went to Lover's Lane. There, Laura denied the unknown guy's advances and he took her life. Since investigators could not identify the young man, they talked to Laura's high school boyfriend, David Kyle Gilly. He was known to be the jealous type, but he had an alibi. His stepfather told the police that David was home all day when Laura's life was taken so he could not be responsible. Thus, he was ruled out as a suspect. Just when investigators ran out of leads to follow, a woman in Nashville, Tennessee called the police with a possible lead. She claimed that she had been assaulted by a man named John Taylor. During the ordeal, Taylor apparently told her that he would do the same thing to her that he did to Laura. When questioned by the police, Taylor denied assaulting the woman and denied talking about Laura or having anything to do with her. A background check discovered that Taylor attended the same university as Laura. He was even a member of the same health club, Olympus Athletic Club and Spa. Taylor also attended the same fraternity gatherings and functions as Laura. Even more relevant, Taylor was near the university on the day that Laura's life was taken. Taylor had a history of being violent towards his girlfriends or his female companions. All this added to his possibility of being a suspect. Investigators then had FBI analysts compare Taylor's hair to the foreign hair they found inside of Laura's car. They received a report back from the FBI that the hair recovered from the vehicle was consistent with John Taylor's hair. Case closed, right? Another asshat caught. But not quite. At the time, mitochondrial DNA testing of human hair was still quite a few years away. The hair could have belonged to about 20% of the population. This was, of course, not concrete enough to arrest Taylor. Even though it seemed like a done deal, there would be a few more twists in this case. Investigators found nothing to link him to the crime scene or to confirm that he was with Laura on that day. The men's pair of jeans found at the crime scene had an inseam of 36 inches and the waist was 30 inches. Taylor was a small fellow and the jeans would not have fit him. Investigators had no choice but to move on to other suspects. Over the years, they looked into over a hundred suspects, but nothing came of it. Laura's mother, Lorene Mackey, made a promise to Laura at her grave. She promised Laura that she would see that justice was done. Lorene didn't really know how she would fulfill that promise, but she decided it was the last thing she could do for Laura. Many long years would pass before help finally came. Dan Goodwin was one of Laura's friends at the university. He went out with her a few nights before her life was ended. Dan asked her if she wanted to go see a movie and they wound up at the cinema on May 27, 1984, where they saw a matinee show of The Natural with Robert Redford. At Laura's funeral, Dan promised her mother that he would help find the perpetrator. 
After graduation, Dan became a newspaper reporter at the Daily News Journal in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. There, he became the police reporter. He wrote about a series of unsolved cases in 1987 which included Laura's case. Dan knew that he was more interested in the actual police work than simply just writing about it. Several years later, Dan left journalism and became a police officer. The very first cold case he was assigned was Laura Salmon's. One of the first things Dan did was send all of the evidence back to the forensic lab for testing. DNA technology had greatly advanced and completely new testing took place. While that was ongoing, Dan followed other leads, one of which came from a high school student. In 2000, a student at Oakland High School was talking about the Laura Salmon case. The student told everyone that his father took the life of a girl in 1984 and thrown her body away. The student's father was David Patterson. He had a police record for aggravated assault. Unfortunately, when Dan wanted to try to speak to Patterson, he learned that Patterson was not alive anymore. He had been fatally shot. Dan, of course, still decided to continue following the lead. They obtained DNA from Patterson's children. The DNA was compared to the male DNA found at the crime scene. It was not a match and he was ruled out as a suspect. Dan then went back to John Taylor who was initially a suspect in the case. His DNA also did not match. In case you were wondering, Dan also provided a DNA sample. After it was tested, it confirmed that Dan was not responsible. Dan then turned his attention to one man who went under the radar in the initial investigation. The name that caught his eye was David Gilly. As earlier mentioned, David was Laura's high school boyfriend, a year younger than her. He was initially ruled out because of the alibi he was given by his stepfather. Dan, however, found that a witness came forward that directly contradicted that alibi. The witness saw David Gilly driving Laura's car on the day that her body was found. She spotted him not far from the road that led to the area where Laura was found. According to the witness, David had a blank expression on his face and was just staring straight ahead. She was able to identify him through a photo lineup as well as Laura's car. Dan also saw David's propensity of violence towards women in his life. This included Laura Salmon. Sometimes he would get mad at her, grab her by the head, banging her head into cars, school lockers, or whatever was nearby. He even sometimes punched her. On one occasion, he broke out two of her front teeth. Dan could not believe David Gilly was so quickly ruled out during the initial investigation. David was approximately 6 foot 2 inches tall, and the men's jeans that were found at the crime scene would have fit him perfectly. Dan then got Jerry Findlay's help on the case. He is a crime scene reconstructionist. Jerry found tiny drops of blood in the jeans. It was medium velocity impact spatter. This sort of spatter usually gets produced when someone is hit with a blunt object such as a rock. The majority of the blood stains were just above the knee. This indicated that the perpetrator was kneeling on the ground as he was hitting Laura with the rocks. All of this evidence just confirmed to investigators that the men's pair of jeans belonged to the person who took Laura's life. It was already believed, but DNA testing confirmed that the blood on the jeans belonged to Laura. Dan then tracked David Gilly down in Florida. By then, Gilly was twice divorced and he was working for the Manatee County Public Works Department. Unsurprisingly, he had a police record. Gilly had arrests for battery, attempted burglary, and resisting arrest. When Dan questioned Gilly, he once again denied any involvement and said that he is not responsible for what happened to Laura. In a strange twist, Gilly did admit that the jeans were probably his. When investigators told him that they believed the owner of the jeans is the perpetrator, he quickly requested an attorney. Investigators then obtained a saliva sample from David Gilly. On May 31st of 2000, 
DNA testing proved that Gilly was the donor of the DNA found at the crime scene and thus responsible for taking Laura's life. On the 16th anniversary of the crime, David Gilly was finally arrested. Dan the man kept his promise to help Laura's mother in solving the case, and Laura's mother kept her promise to Laura that she would see justice take place. The motive was believed to be jealousy. If Gilly could not have Laura, he believed no one else could either. When she went off to college and he was still in high school, she made new friends and he didn't like that. He would often stalk her. Laura's mother tried to convince Laura to get a restraining order against Gilly, but she was too afraid. Investigators believe that Gilly somehow coaxed Laura out to the deserted lover's lane, where he struck her in the head repeatedly with rocks. After seeing that there was blood on his jeans, Gilly took them off and left them at the crime scene. He then drove Laura's car to her workplace, where it would later be found. In September of 2006, David Gilly went on trial. The defense claimed the presence of another man's DNA was proof that someone else was at the crime scene. The jury never believed any other DNA at the crime scene belonged to the real perpetrator. Gilly was found guilty of all the charges against him and he was sentenced to life in prison. Narborough is an extremely safe village in Leicestershire, England. It is known for one crime and one crime only. It took place in 1983. Fifteen-year-old Linda Mann lived in Narborough. She attended Lutterworth Grammar School and Community College. She was the younger sister of Susan Mann, who was two years her senior. Their mother was Kathleen Mann, who moved to Narborough after her marriage ended. Kathleen married Edward Eastwood in 1980 when Susan was 14 and Linda was 12. Linda was described as a typical teenager. She was quiet, but popular. She liked school and enjoyed being with friends. Linda had little trouble with adolescence. An adventurous girl, she liked everything about growing up, music, hairstyles, makeup, and clothes. If money for clothes was a bit short, Linda would babysit to earn money and make her own dresses. On November 21st of 1983, Linda walked to a friend's house, but never made it there. She promised Kathleen and Edward that she would be home by 10 p.m. By midnight, Linda was still not home. Her frantic parents called the police. They searched all night for her. A hospital porter discovered her body at 7.20 a.m. as he was on his way to work. He initially thought it was a mannequin. Linda had been assaulted and strangled. Her jeans were removed and the rest of her clothes were strewn about. She had a scarf around her neck. The scarf was used to strangle her. When people in Narborough heard about the crime, they were absolutely horrified. Young girls were encouraged to walk in groups from then on. Investigators searched the immediate area around the crime scene, but were not able to find anything useful. Only a few hundred yards away from the crime scene, there was a local psychiatric hospital. Some people believed that the perpetrator could be a patient at the hospital, but no evidence of this was found. During the autopsy, male DNA was collected from Linda's body. The individual had type A blood. This meant about 10% of the adult male population in England could be responsible. Edward's blood was taken and it was found he was not the same 10% blood group as the slayer of Linda. A group of investigators walked from house to house to see if they could gather any information. Other investigators made a list of all offenders of similar crimes in Leicestershire and went about questioning them all. Investigators received a call about a spiky-haired youth. The person on the phone claimed to have seen him at about 8 p.m., about two minutes away from where Linda's body was found. Unfortunately, he was never identified. For three long years, investigators tried to find the perpetrator. It was then, in 1986, that tragedy struck again.
15-year-old Dawn Ashworth lived in Enderby, Leicestershire with her parents and her brother Andrew. She was gifted at drawing. She had a part-time job working at the newsagent's shop in Enderby. On July 31st of 1986, Dawn left work at 4 p.m. and headed to her friend's house in Narborough. She was told to be home by 7 p.m. Dawn was last seen at 4.40 p.m. by passing motorists passing King Edward Avenue. By 7.30 p.m., with no sign of Dawn, her parents got concerned. They drove through Narborough and they couldn't find her. At 9.40 p.m., they called the police. They could not help but think of Linda Mann and hoping their daughter did not suffer a similar fate. A few days later, police officers searching for Dawn found her body in a field beside Ten Pound Lane. She had been assaulted and strangled. Male DNA collected from Dawn's body revealed the attacker had the same blood type as the man that slayed Linda Mann. This was not the only similarity. Both crimes took place on footpaths. Both girls were teenagers and both walking alone. They were both found in similar circumstances having suffered the same fate. Linda and Dawn both attended Lutterworth Grammar School and Community College. At the foot of Ten Pound Lane, the police parked a mobile incident room to take information from villagers and passers-by. The police took about 200 telephone calls and dozens of people visited the mobile unit. The most promising new lead concerned a motorcycle that had been parked under the motorway bridge. There were several reports of a young man in a red crash helmet observed in the vicinity sometime around 5 p.m. on the day of the crime. On August 1st, the day after Dawn was reported missing, but a day before her body was found, a policewoman and a detective saw a youth on a red motorcycle and a red crash helmet take an interest in the search. A police constable on security duty was approached by a 17-year-old kitchen porter from Carlton Hayes Hospital. It is the psychiatric hospital close to where both Linda and Dawn's bodies were found. The kitchen porter told the constable that he saw Dawn walking on the day she disappeared. The constable arranged that they talk to him later again to find out some more information. Before they could talk to him again, valuable information was given to the incident room. The information came from the kitchen porter's friend who also worked at the Carlton Hayes Hospital. This friend had been on holiday the day Don went missing, but he had gone to the hospital to collect his wages. The kitchen porter visited him at 10 p.m. and excitedly told him that Don's body had been found in a hedge near a gate by the M1 bridge. The friend's father overheard the conversation and asked the kitchen porter where he had gotten his information because nothing about Don's case had been on the television. Someone told me, the kitchen porter said mysteriously. Her body was hanging from a tree. Don's body wasn't hanging from a tree, but she was concealed beneath tree limbs and other debris. She was found inside an access gate leading from Ten Pound Lane to the fields. It was just a 10-minute walk from the M1 bridge. How did the kitchen porter have all the information about where Dawn's body was more than 12 hours before police found her body? After investigators learned all of this information, they went to his house to arrest him. The kitchen porter is Richard Buckland. Buckland was then driven to Wigston Police Station so he could be interrogated further. Buckland gave inconsistent statements to investigators, but did admit that he saw Dawn on the day she disappeared and that he did talk to her. Through his rambles, he at one point confessed to everything and then quickly took it all back. During the third interview with him, Buckland gave a detailed confession. He was able to give so many facts about the crime scene that were not public at the time. Before Richard Buckland went on trial, Dawn Ashworth was buried. Four weeks after she was taken from a village footpath, she was buried in a little cemetery behind St. John Baptist Church in Enderby. The vicar described her as a bright, lively, charming young lady, obedient to her parents, loyal to her family, and full of the joy of life. 
200 people showed up at the cemetery behind the stone church to bid farewell to Dawn. Investigators were still building up their case against Richard Buckland and heard about something called DNA testing. They were already convinced that he took Dawn's life and probably Linda Mann's as well, but they figured they could try this new technology. All the DNA evidence from both crime scenes were sent to a young geneticist. He worked at Leicestershire University and claimed to have come up with a wondrous new discovery called genetic fingerprinting. The geneticist was Dr. Alec Jeffries. Dr. Jeffries was not sure how he could do what investigators wanted him to do. This sort of analysis had never been done before. Dr. Jeffries first used his technique to resolve an immigration case and after that, a paternity dispute. This would be the first time that this new technology would be used in a criminal case to reveal the identity of a perpetrator. To everyone's surprise, when the DNA tests came back, it showed that Buckland was innocent and did not take Linda's life. Even more surprising, he did not take Dawn's life either. Dr. Jeffrey's tests, however, were able to determine that investigators did at least get one thing right. It was the same man responsible for both crimes. Richard Buckland was then released and became the first person to be exonerated through the use of DNA profiling. Inspector Derek Pierce then took charge of the investigation. Pierce read 1,800 messages that came from the public. One of the messages pertained to a man whose name had popped up on the Linda Mann inquiry because he was unalibied and had a prior record for flashing. Of course, Hundreds of names had been called in anonymously by wives, lovers, rivals, neighbors, and many of those names belonging to people with prior indecency arrests. This one wasn't worth special attention because in the earlier inquiry, he had been shown not to have moved to the village until one month after Linda's slaying. The message about him that the police received read, You ought to have a look at a man in Littlethorpe named Colin Pitchfork. With there being so many unalibied men in the area, investigators came up with a new idea. They started to see what DNA could do, and decided that every unalibied male resident in the villages between ages of 17 and 34 years old would be asked to submit blood and saliva samples voluntarily. It was announced to the public on the 2nd of January 1987. Derek Pierce didn't believe the perpetrator was going to simply volunteer. He said, we just hope it might somehow flush him out. By the end of January, a thousand men had taken the tests and only a quarter of that number had been cleared. The forensic laboratory was swamped, and it seemed certain that the testing was going to take longer than the early estimation of two months. By May, 3,653 men had taken the tests, yet only 2,000 had been eliminated due to the workload under which the laboratory technicians labored. Then, on September 18th of 1987, the police received a call that they had been waiting for. A woman called and said she heard a concerning conversation take place between a group of friends in the Clarendon pub in Leicester. One of the men, Ian Kelly, talked out loud about how he took the blood test for the investigation on behalf of a friend, Colin Pitchfork. Investigators looked into Pitchfork's file and saw his history of flashing women. They also saw that his signature from when they did house calls did not match the signature that he made or gave on the day he supposedly took the blood test. He was married to Carol Pitchfork. He worked at a bakery, and Pitchfork was known as a womanizer and had a string of affairs. On September 19th of 1987, Derek Pierce went to Ian Kelly's house to ask him some questions. Ian was also a baker, and he worked with Colin Pitchfork. Ian at first denied taking Pitchfork's blood test, but then admitted it. Ian told Pierce what Pitchfork had told him. Pitchfork said that he was worried the police would assume he was responsible for what happened to Linda and Dawn based on his history of flashing. Pitchfork was a master manipulator and convinced Ian to go to the incident room and take the blood test on his behalf. Later that day, a group of investigators went to Pitchfork's house. 
Detective Mick Thomas gave it to him straight. From inquiries that we have made, we believe you're responsible for taking Don Ashworth's life on the 31st of July, 1986. We believe another man gave a blood sample for you. I am arresting you. Do you understand? Colin Pitchfork didn't deny it. His face said it all. He knew he had been caught. He even explained that he entered a photo of Ian Kelly in his passport so investigators would not suspect anything. When Carol Pitchfork entered the room, it was explained to her what was going on. She immediately started kicking and punching her husband. Understandably, investigators were slow to stop her. At the police station, Pitchfork first explained what he did to Linda Mann. He said that he planned on flashing her but it turned into more when he realized she would recognize him one day. After he committed the crime, Pitchfork went back to his car where his and Carol's baby was tied up in his seat and went home. Pitchfork then told investigators what he did to Don Ashworth. Both crimes happened the exact same way. He told investigators that he knew what he was doing but could not stop himself from doing those things. Pitchfork also said that he tried to take Ian Kelly's life a few times to make sure he never talked, but his plans always failed. On January 22nd of 1988, 28-year-old Colin Pitchfork went on trial at the Crown Court in Leicester. Firstly, Ian Kelly was given an 18-month prison sentence suspended for two years, which meant he would not have to serve time. When Ian stepped out of the courtroom, he faced the media. I was wrong for doing what I did. I am sorry for whoever I caused grievance to. Colin Pitchfork was dressed in summer clothes, jeans and a short-sleeved shirt. He pleaded guilty to taking the lives of both Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. He received a double life sentence for his crimes. Much to the astonishment of investigators, the judge did not give a recommendation for a minimum term. Without such a recommendation, the life sentence in Britain was similar to that in the United States, which meant that Colin Pitchfork could conceivably be released in 10 or 12 years. The police were outraged. Linda Mann's stepfather, Eddie Eastwood, said, Pitchfork looked at me, eye to eye. He just stared at me as if to say, well, what's the matter with you? I could not make him out. He looked almost human. Linda's mother Kathleen said, it was the shock of seeing him. I did not look up when the lawyer passed those photos of Linda to the bench. Those photos of how she looked when they found her, the cover dropped open and the audience gasped when they saw the photos. My brother saw them and cried. Luckily, I did not look up. He must never be allowed to walk the streets again. He should hang. With this new DNA genetic fingerprint, there is no chance of a person being later proved innocent after he has been hanged. There is no excuse anymore. When all the dust settled, investigators still faced the question of why Richard Buckland knew so many details of the crime scene of Dawn Ashworth. They believe that he stumbled upon her body on his way to work. He has often been described as the village idiot, and it is believed that played a part in why he confessed. The cases of Linda Mann and Don Ashworth are seen as a big reason why DNA technology has advanced so much. Today, thousands of cold cases have been solved thanks to Dr. Alec Jeffries. Debbie Ann Dudley Davis was born in Lynchburg, Virginia on July 15th of 1952. She had a brief marriage after school that ended in divorce. Debbie then followed her cousin Judy Fisk to Richmond, Virginia and moved into an apartment on Devonshire Street in the Westover Hills neighborhood. Debbie started working as Style Weekly's accounts manager in 1985. They are a media outlet based in Richmond. Debbie was a pop culture fan who enjoyed Bruce Springsteen records. She was an extra in the HBO movie Finnegan Begin Again. Debbie was an avid mystery novel reader. She worked a couple nights a week at the Walden Bookstore at Cloverleaf Mall in Chesterfield County. 
On the evening of September 18th of 1987, Debbie and her co-worker Deanna Hof took a road trip to Virginia Beach. They went to see a performance by Dana Carvey. After the show, Deanna dropped Debbie at her apartment and waited to drive off until she was safely inside. Little did Deanna know this would be the last time she ever saw Debbie again. The next morning, a man named Arnold Ellis saw a Renault Alliance parked in front of his house. He noticed the motor was running. The keys were in the ignition, and there was no sign of the car's driver. Arnold Ellis then called the police. Police officers determined that the car belonged to Debbie Davis. She lived one street over from Arnold Ellis. A police officer knocked on Debbie's door but got no response. An elderly neighbor then came to give the officer a key. Inside, the officer saw Debbie's body face down on her bed. She was topless, wearing only a pair of cut-off jean shorts. Her right arm was tied behind her back with thick boot laces. Debbie's left arm was tied beneath her. The perpetrator tightly twisted a black sock around her neck. She had been strangled and assaulted. Investigators discovered that the perpetrator stole a rocking chair from a nearby porch and propped it up outside Debbie's kitchen window to gain entrance. Next to Debbie's bed on her nightstand was a mystery novel she had been reading called Presumed Innocent. It was about a woman who was tied up and then her life was taken. Investigators knew the perpetrator was smart and most likely experienced. He left no fingerprints. There were no witnesses, and nothing had been taken as far as investigators could tell. Detective Ray Williams said, Very seldom does a crook do that kind of damage and spend that much time with his victim and not leave a bunch of clues, but he left nothing. Lorna Wyckoff, the founder of Style Weekly, posted a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Investigators looked at people in Debbie's life to see if anyone stood out, but found nothing. Debbie led a quiet life. Debbie was not dating anyone, she had not seen her ex-husband in years, and she did not use drugs and did not hang out in bars. Just two weeks after Debbie's life was ended, tragedy would strike again in Richmond, Virginia. Susan Elizabeth Hellams was born on February 6th of 1955 in Charleston, South Carolina. She moved to Richmond, Virginia to work on a residency in neurosurgery at the Medical College of Virginia. Susan married Marcel Slag and bought a house in the tranquil Woodland Heights neighborhood in Richmond. On October 3rd of 1987, Marcel pulled up to their house at 1.45 a.m. As he entered the house, he could hear her moving around upstairs. Marcel knew she had worked late and thought he might have woken her up. He quickly took a shower and silently crept into their dark bedroom. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he could make out a sight from a horror movie. His wife's partially nude body laying half out of their bedroom closet. A red leather belt was around her neck. Susan's hands had been bound tightly behind her back with an extension cord and necktie. Just like Debbie, Susan had been assaulted and strangled. Marcel saw their bedroom window was wide open. Their house was a little less than a mile away from Debbie Davis's house. Detective Ray Williams was on duty that night and was ordered to work both cases. Williams said that the perpetrator was still in the house when Marcel arrived home. He heard somebody upstairs. It couldn't have been Susan. She was already gone. On the balcony outside the window, investigators found an open Vaseline jar left by the perpetrator. They traced its purchase to a store adjacent to nearby Cloverleaf Mall. The lead was followed but led to nowhere. Realizing a serial offender is in their midst, the community erupted into fear. They demanded action from the police. Williams worked tirelessly for days and finally, he did find a clue that could potentially be useful. When he looked through the financial records at the Cloverleaf Mall Walden Bookstore where Debbie worked part-time, he found a check written by Susan and endorsed on the back by Debbie. 
Williams wasn't sure if this was just a coincidence or if it was a possible link between the two crimes. As Detective Williams pondered this question, yet another horrendous crime took place in the Richmond area. Diane Cho was born in Korea in 1972. She and her family immigrated to the United States in 1984. On 1987, 15-year-old Diane was a freshman at Manchester High School. She was very smart and took care of virtually everything for her parents who barely spoke English. In October of 1987, Diane told one of her friends about a disturbing, recurring nightmare she had been having. Diane kept having dreams about an unknown man following her. She also told her friends at school that she sometimes saw this unknown man from her dreams at the mall. One night in November of 1987, Diane went to the Cloverleaf Mall Theater with a friend. They bought tickets for the Princess Bride. She then began trembling with fright and pointed out her stalker, who was staring at them from the parking lot. It had been barely five months since Diane's family moved to Richmond, where her parents worked long hours running a convenience store near Virginia Commonwealth University. It's not known if Diane ever told her parents about the encounter with the unknown man at the Cloverleaf Mall. On the night of November 21st of 1987, Diane's parents arrived home to their apartment around 9. Diane's mother then gave her a haircut. As they went to bed around midnight, they could hear Diane typing out an English paper in her bedroom across the hall. The next day, Diane's parents called home around 2 p.m. to remind their children to get ready for an afternoon church service. Diane's 12-year-old brother, Roman, answered the phone. Diane was still asleep, and he did not want to anger her by waking her up. Diane's parents arrived home about an hour later and her mother went straight to Diane's bedroom and opened the door. Diane's mom then screamed loudly. Diane was tied up with rope. She had been strangled and assaulted and her bedroom window was open. You can clearly see the pattern of all the crimes. It would happen again for the fourth time. 44-year-old Sue Tucker lived in Arlington County, Virginia in November of 1987. She was an editor for a Department of Agriculture magazine. Her husband, Reg Tucker, was a former photographer for the Fairfax County Public Schools. Reg had taken a job as a photography teacher in his native country of Wales in early 1987. Sue was preparing the couple's home for sale and winding down her projects at work as she planned to join her husband in Wales. Ironically, they wanted to immigrate because of an increase in violence in the United States. They were worried about crime. A neighbor of the couple, Audrey Sizelove, had been unable to reach Sue for a few days and noticed that Sue's bedroom window had been open for days. When Audrey tried to enter their home to check on her friend, she smelled an odor like rotting flesh. She called the police, who arrived and found Sue's badly decomposing body laid out across her bed. She had been tightly bound in nylon ropes, strangled, and assaulted. There were no fingerprints. The perpetrator had broken in through a small basement laundry room window. Before leaving, he had taken the time to fix a snack. He discarded a partially eaten orange on the Tucker's dining room table. While investigators were inside the house, the telephone rang. It was Reg Tucker. The last few days he had been trying to reach Sue. Police officers had to give him the horrible news. Arlington investigators who were assigned to the case realized the crime was very similar to the one that took place in January of 1984. It was then that 32-year-old attorney Carolyn Ham was slain. Her body had been found not far from Sue Tucker's home. David Vasquez, a fast food worker with a low IQ, had confessed to that crime and was serving a 35-year prison sentence for it. If he was in prison, why were there identical crimes being committed almost four years later? Arlington County Detective Joe Horgus was the lead investigator on Sue Tucker's case. He traveled to the prison to interview David Vasquez because the modus operandi was the same. 
the hands tied behind the back, rope around the neck, and they were both assaulted. After the interview, it was clear to the detective that Vasquez was not at all involved with what happened to Sue. As investigators in both Arlington County and Richmond investigated their cases, they noticed something. Just like Richmond had a serial offender attacking women in their homes in 1987, Arlington County had their own maniac in 1983 and 1984. It all started in Arlington in June of 1983 with the abduction and assault of a woman in the county's Green Valley area by a knife-wielding black man in his late teens or early 20s wearing a homemade mask. Over the next seven months, as his attacks escalated, he abducted women in their cars and entered their houses and apartments through unlocked windows. He relentlessly assaulted and brutalized nine women. He tied some of them up with nylon cords cut from their Venetian blinds. Former Arlington County Commonwealth's attorney Halen Fahey was quoted as saying he was a one-person crime wave. In January of 1984, an Arlington woman came home to discover evidence from an unsettling break-in. The cords of her Venetian blinds had been cut and were laid out on her bed. The intruder left the house. It seemed like he was there waiting for her to come home and got tired of waiting. It was four days after that that Carolyn Ham was found bound and strangled in her garage. Arlington police arrested David Vasquez and charged him with taking her life. Vasquez did not match the description that any of the assault victims gave, but the crimes in the area did stop. It was only after Sue Tucker's slaying that investigators learned the perpetrator of all the assaults was definitely not Vasquez and the unknown man took a brief hiatus and then continued his attacks in Richmond. Detective Horgus received a teletype from Richmond police where they described the identical strangulations of Debbie Davis, Susan Hellams, and Diane Cho. After sharing all the information, investigators concluded it was the same man responsible for all the crimes, perhaps even Carolyn Ham's slaying. The investigation stalled for another few agonizing weeks while they hoped for a break in the case before the strangler could take another life. Investigators looked at the timeline of the crimes. Many of them took place in 1983 to 1984 and then continued in 1987. The FBI felt that the perpetrator would not have stopped his attacks of his own volition. It was likely that he had been jailed for another offense between the slayings of Carolyn Ham and Debbie Davis. As detectives tried to think about possible suspects, one of them thought of Tommy Spencer. He was a teenager that was arrested for burglary during the mid-1970s. Investigators discovered that Spencer had been arrested in January of 1984 for break-ins in neighboring Alexandria. He had been paroled to a halfway house in Richmond in 1987 right before Debbie's life was taken. Investigators went to the halfway house. They found that Spencer signed himself out on every evening a crime took place. He got a furlough to go to Arlington on the day that Sue Tucker's life was taken. Investigators decided to put Spencer under surveillance. They wanted to catch him in the act of doing something incriminating. Over two weeks, plainclothes Richmond police officers observed Spencer committing parole violations, like spending the night at his girlfriend's house. They were intrigued to find that he would hang out for hours at Cloverleaf Mall. As you remember, the mall had strong ties to Debbie Davis, Susan Hellams, and Diane Cho. On January 20th of 1988, Arlington and Richmond detectives took Spencer into custody and took a sample of his blood. Without witnesses or fingerprints, or any other direct evidence tying Spencer to the crimes, law enforcement had to rely on a brand new forensic science method called DNA fingerprinting. At that stage, it has only been used in one cold case in the United Kingdom and never before in the United States. It was the case of Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. It would take more than six weeks, but a private lab in New York would report back that Spencer's DNA had been matched to male DNA at the crime scenes of Debbie Davis, Dr. Susan Hellams, Susan Tucker, and assault victims in Arlington and Richmond. 
Timothy Spencer was the man who had become known as the Southside Strangler. He went to trial in July of 1988. After a six-day trial, he was found guilty. It was the first conviction based on DNA evidence in the United States. Spencer was given multiple life sentences. What about Carolyn Ham and David Vasquez, you ask? Why was he found guilty of the crime if he didn't match the description that was given by victims of any other crime in the area? David Vasquez first became a suspect in that case because Carolyn complained that he was peeping on her while she was sunbathing in the week leading up to her demise. With his low IQ, it was easy for investigators to get a false confession out of him. They revealed all of the details to him and he parroted it back to them. After DNA linked Timothy Spencer to all the other crimes, investigators were seriously doubting that Vasquez was involved. DNA soon proved it as well, and David was released. David became known as the first person in the United States that was exonerated thanks to DNA. Shortly before 11 p.m. on Wednesday, April 27th of 1994, Timothy Wilson Spencer was strapped into Virginia's sturdy oak and electric chair dubbed Old Sparky at Greensville Correctional Center and was executed, finally bringing a stop to the horrendous crime spree. Catherine Louise Martin was born on October 25, 1959. Her family and friends referred to her as Kathy. Kathy met Mike Odom in high school when they were 16 years old. They dated for a while and then decided to marry. Before they could get married, Mike was arrested for selling heroin. He sold it to an undercover officer. He was sentenced to six years for this crime, but only served two. Kathy told her family that she was set on marrying him when he got released. Two years later, when he was freed, they did end up marrying. Kathy and Mike had two children together, Tasha and Sean. They lived in Harris County, Texas. Kathy's father, Frankie Martin, decided to give Mike a job at his sign business. Kathy did everything to ensure the marriage worked. She was also described as a loving mother who would have done anything for her kids. On the night of March 3, 1987, Mike tried to contact Kathy. He was out of town working. Kathy was supposed to be home with the children, so it was alarming to him when she did not answer the phone. Mike called their next-door neighbor and asked him to check up on Kathy and their children. The neighbor knocked on the door, but there was no answer. He looked in through the windows and saw that the television was still on. Instead of calling police, the neighbor drove into town, found a policeman, and they both drove back to the Odom's house. The officer found the front door to be unlocked. He entered the house, and inside of the living room sofa was four-year-old Tasha. She had been beaten badly and unconscious, but was fortunately still alive. Two-month-old Sean was found unharmed in his bedroom. In Kathy and Mike's bedroom, the officer found Kathy's battered, naked body. She was covered in blood. Kathy had been severely beaten and stabbed more than 16 times. She had also been strangled, assaulted, and her wrists were bound with a cord to a lamp. Officers feared that the person responsible for this would come back and finish the job they started with Tasha. Both Tasha and Sean were taken to the hospital. It was ordered that they could not be left alone. Kathy's father, Frankie, arrived at the crime scene. He was told to go to the hospital to be with his grandchildren. While at the hospital, Frankie learned about what happened to his daughter on a TV screen. Meanwhile, back at the house, Mike finally arrived. Policemen paid special attention to his appearance. One of the officers noted that Mike had several red stains on his shirt. It looked like blood. A search of the Odom's house revealed blood in the bathroom. The perpetrator, possibly Mike, had attempted to clean up before leaving. 
police found no sign of a break-in. All doors were locked except for the front door. This indicated that Kathy knew the person that took her life. The fact that she was stabbed so many times also told investigators it was a personal crime. Kathy's clothes told police something about what happened. They were found neatly folded on the floor. Investigators theorized that the perpetrator attacked Tasha in order to get whatever he wanted from Kathy. Back at the hospital, Tasha was in critical condition. She was in a coma and was reliant on IVs. While doctors worked on saving her life, investigators focused on her father, Mike Odom. He appeared emotional and distraught, but investigators had their doubts about him from the start. Investigators discovered that Mike did not come straight home from work like he said he would. He had gone out with friends of his. To investigators, it was something they had seen before. An individual arranging a slaying, being at a different location, then calling someone else to go check in on the victim. Mike's clothing was taken to the forensic lab for testing. That was not all. Investigators also found strange stains on the car floor of the neighbor, Tim Robinson. It was clear to investigators. Tim and Mike conducted a plan to take Kathy's life. Perhaps Mike was using again and was seeking insurance money. But there was soon a twist in the case. The medical examiner estimated that Kathy's life was taken around six hours before her body was found. That would be about one o'clock in the afternoon. Both Mike and Tim claimed to be at work at the time. While investigators checked their alibis, a witness came forward. That witness is four-year-old Tasha Odom. She emerged from her coma and told investigators that she remembers a man entering the house. Tasha said the man had yellow hair. Neither Mike Odom nor Tim Robinson had blonde hair. Unfortunately, the man's hair color was all Tasha could remember. When the forensic tests came back, it showed that the stains in Tim's car were motor oil. The stains on Mike's shirt was paint. Furthermore, co-workers provided solid alibis for both Mike and Tim. Each of them also passed polygraph tests. The two of them were then ruled out and investigators could move on to the next person. That next person was not very hard to find. Kathy had a sister, Shelley Martin. She was married to Greg Markwart. They met thanks to Mike. Greg and Mike had been close since they were both in the drug scene. Like Kathy, Shelley was also 16 when she met the man she would marry. Greg was 25 years old at the time, which should have been a red flag already. Greg and Shelley married in 1983. Soon after, both Shelley and Kathy got addicted, just like Greg and Mike. Greg and Shelley were known to steal from her parents for money. Greg had been raised by a wealthy aunt and uncle, and the aunt repaid the Martins the money and everyone agreed not to file charges. While Mike and Kathy had turned their lives around, Greg and Shelley did not. They were in and out of jail frequently. Shortly before Kathy's life was taken, she told a friend that Greg and Shelley had been over recently, and that while Shelley was in the other room with the baby, Greg had made advances towards her, which she of course rejected. When questioned, Greg would claim that on the night of the crime, at the times in which he was not with his wife, he was with a man named Hampton Robinson III. In an unimportant but interesting note, Robinson was a friend of Charles Harrelson. Harrelson was the father of actor Woody Harrelson, and in 1982 was convicted of slaying a judge. In fact, Robinson had testified against Harrelson at his trial. 
There was ample evidence that Greg had been in the house. They found his fingerprints and his hair throughout the crime scene. There was only one problem. As a family member who had been in the house numerous times, this did not prove a thing. Kathy's parents told investigators that they believed Greg was responsible. Frankie said that two days after Kathy's slaying, he received a phone call in the middle of the night from the hospital where Tasha was being treated, telling him that Shelley and Greg had come to visit. Frankie told them to not allow admittance, first because he was suspicious of Greg, but also the fact that no one had a reason to be there at three in the morning, especially them. Tasha's grandmother, Charlene Martin, who was at the hospital, recalled what happened. When Tasha saw Greg, she became very scared and he was ordered to leave. Investigators asked Tasha if it was her uncle Greg that she saw inside their house with Kathy on the day of the attack. Unfortunately, she could not remember. Investigators tried many techniques, but due to her head injury, she could not remember a thing. While Greg denied any involvement when talking to investigators, he was surprisingly open about his attraction to Kathy particularly to one part of her body. Greg had a thing for Kathy's stomach. This fixation was so obvious that Kathy had even mentioned it to her friends. Interestingly enough, Kathy was mainly stabbed in the stomach. At one point during the interview, Greg asked to leave to put more money in a parking lot meter. He never came back. He also refused a polygraph. Investigators decided to look into his alibi. Shelley said that Greg drove her to school at 10.30 a.m. on the day of the crime and picked her up again at 2.30 p.m. This four-hour window was more than enough time for Greg to commit the crime. And as you'll remember, the medical examiner determined that her life was taken around 1 p.m. that day. Even though Kathy was assaulted, this crime occurred years before DNA was widely used in cold case investigations. At the time, they were using serology. Basically, they were doing blood group typing. It was very difficult to do, and you need a very large sample. You'd still just get a blood type, which was not very conclusive. The blood type from the evidence collected from Kathy's body was consistent with Greg Marquardt's blood type. He was type O, as well as the perpetrator. About 50% of the population has the same blood type, so it did not tell investigators much. Without more evidence, the case sadly went cold for some time. For Frankie, it was especially difficult. Believing that the man who took his daughter's life was married to his other daughter. In 1998, a cold case team was formed, and one of the first cases they looked at was that of Kathy Odoms. By then, DNA testing was dependable enough to generate a DNA profile from the biological evidence in Kathy's case. Tests showed that Greg Marquardt was part of the 2% of the general population who could have been the perpetrator. Still not conclusive, but a lot better than 50%. Greg quickly came up with an explanation to investigators. He claimed that he and Kathy were having a consensual affair. Greg said that he was with her on the morning her life was taken. He insisted that she was alive when he left. Greg was not arrested at the time because even though investigators did not believe him, they were concerned that they did not have enough for a conviction. They had to prove that he was present when the crime was committed. Investigators reached out to Catherine Long, who worked for Orchard Selmark, a private forensic lab in Dallas, Texas. Catherine came up with an unusual strategy to try and solve Kathy's crime. She and her colleagues were strangling each other. Let me explain. They wanted to determine if a perpetrator would deposit skin cells in the act of choking a victim. 
They realized that there was indeed a significant transfer of skin cells from the perpetrator to the victim. Investigators needed to find something in Kathy's evidence file that would have contained the perpetrator's skin cells. They decided to do tests on the electrical cord that was used to bind Kathy's hands. In an incredible piece of luck, the cord had been stored in a paper bag and not a plastic bag. The paper bag provides breathability so that there is not any moisture on the item inside and it's going to stay dry. That will therefore prolong the DNA life. It will actually preserve the DNA longer than if it were in a plastic bag. The cord was covered in blood. Investigators swabbed the cord to obtain all the evidence they could. Testing revealed two genetic profiles, that of Kathy Odom and that of Greg Markwads. The only way Markwad's DNA could be on the cord was if, in fact, he was the perpetrator. Finally, on December 18, 2002, Greg Markwad was arrested and charged with taking Kathy's life. While in prison, Markwad confessed to a fellow inmate. He said that he was high on heroin when he drove to Kathy's house that day. Once inside, he made advances that she rejected. To force her to comply, he struck Tasha repeatedly in the head. He then threatened to take Sean's life as well. In order to save her children's lives, she had to comply. With a knife from the kitchen, Marquat then cut the electrical cord from the lamp and tied Kathy's hands. After he assaulted her, he took her life. Marquat then cleaned up in the bathroom and changed into Mike Odom's clothing. Little did he know that advances in DNA technology would be used to identify him as the perpetrator 15 years later. Six months after his arrest, Greg's wealthy aunt passed away, leaving him hundreds of thousands of dollars and part ownership of her home. The Martins decided to file a suit against him, and it tied up the estate, which prevented him from using those funds towards his defense. In 2004, Greg Marquardt pled guilty, and he was convicted of all the charges against him. In July of the same year, he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. He passed away of liver disease after serving four years of his sentence in 2008. He was 56 years old. Sergeant Roger Wedsworth was quoted as saying, couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Shelley and her parents lost contact after the crime. She took Mark Wood's side while they believed he was responsible. It was said that for a long time, Shelley continued to support Mark Wood and believed in his innocence. A few years after the crime, the Martins moved to Oklahoma. A few years after that, it seemed that Shelley made up with her parents and she too moved to Oklahoma to be near her parents. Kathy's father, Frankie, said, It does not bring back Kathy. I will always remember her, the house she put together, and the things we did. It is always tough to lose a child. Raina Lynn Rison was born on May 6, 1976, in LaPorte, Indiana. She lived with her parents, Ben and Karen Rison. She had an older sister, Lori, and a younger sister, Wendy. In 1993, 16-year-old Raina was described as a good student and aspired to a career as a veterinarian because of her deep compassion for animals. Other than being a sophomore at LaPorte High School, Raina worked three jobs as well. She worked at the animal hospital where she walked dogs and cleaned kettles. On Friday, March 26, 1993, Raina was tasked with closing the animal hospital after a short shift from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Raina and her ex-boyfriend, Matt Elser, were planning to spend the evening together, and she could not wait to see him again. They had recently broken up, and the date was a step towards possibly getting back together. 
Like Reyna, Matt came from a good, upstanding family and was regarded as a decent young man. In short, he was the kind of guy any parent would be happy to have their daughter date. Matt arrived at the animal hospital at 6 p.m. to pick up Reyna. He got out of his car after waiting a while and headed to the front door, where he found that all of the lights were off and the door was closed. Matt saw that Reyna's car was not in the parking lot, so he drove to her home to see if she was there. Reyna's father, Ben, told Matt that she had not returned home from work. They hadn't seen her since she left home to go to the animal hospital for her shift. Her family assumed she was out on the date with Matt, but now they were worried. It was very unlike Reyna to not tell her family where exactly she was. Reyna's parents, her younger sister Wendy, and Matt all waited in the house for Reyna to come home. When Reyna had still not shown up by 10.30 p.m., her family went to the police station to report her as missing. The police could only register a missing person's report after waiting for 24 hours. Ben gave them a photo of Reyna and asked them to be on the lookout either way since it was so unlike Reyna. Her family then started to look for her. They tried to get in touch with her acquaintances, but no one knew where she could be. They also handed out missing persons flyers in the area, hoping someone would come forward with valuable information. When the police got involved, they made a public appeal for any information that led to Reyna's whereabouts. Immediately, a handful of eyewitnesses came forward, saying that just before 6 p.m., they saw a sedan parked outside the animal hospital where Reyna worked. Multiple eyewitnesses said they saw two men in the sedan along with Reyna. It appeared that Reyna was arguing with the men. The witnesses ignored it at first since they assumed it was just a couple having an argument. Matt Elser was questioned by investigators. He stuck to his story about waiting for Reyna and discovering that she was not at the animal hospital. The police learned that Matt had wanted to take a break from the relationship. They had taken a break, but recently gotten back together. Their date that night was supposed to be really special, and they were both looking forward to it. Matt knew something serious had to have happened for Reyna to not show up. Reyna's parents assured the authorities that Matt was a good and trustworthy young man. They also pointed out that his car was not the one witnesses saw, clearing him of any wrongdoing. Reyna's car was discovered the night after she disappeared, not far from the animal hospital. The car's hood was raised and gave the impression that she may have had car trouble. Officers were able to get her car started easily with her keys that were still in the ignition when they arrived. It appeared as if the car breakdown was staged. Furthermore, officers saw that Reyna's handbag was still in her car which contained her purse and credit cards. All of her money was also still in the car, which meant this was definitely not a robbery. A man's ring was found in Reyna's glove compartment. It was shown to Matt Elser. Matt said that it was not his ring. He identified the man's ring as belonging to Jason Tibbs. Jason was Reyna's ex-boyfriend. They dated back in the seventh grade and broke up after being together for around eight months. He had a criminal history and had dropped out of school. Police decided to question 16-year-old Jason Tibbs. He admitted that the ring in question was really his and inquired as to where it had been found. When officers informed him it had been discovered in Reyna's car, he claimed that they were still friends and he had done some work on the car and must have forgotten his ring in the glove compartment. Jason said that he had taken off his ring to protect it from grime and grease while working on the car. Locals vouched for Jason and said that he was an excellent mechanic. It seemed plausible that Reyna had contacted him if she was having car trouble. Investigators asked him where he was on the night that she disappeared. Jason claimed that he had been playing a game of fox hunting. Fox hunting is a game of hide and seek but played in cars. 
Friends share their locations over wireless radios and try to hunt each other down. His friends confirmed they'd been playing fox hunting that evening, but no one had actually seen Jason. Reyna's father confirmed that Reyna and Jason were friends, so the ring seemed to be a dead end. Reyna's case started to go cold until the police made a discovery. Matt's letterman jacket was found by a Laporte sheriff's deputy. Reyna had last been seen with the jacket. Matt gave it to Reyna to wear. It signified that the two of them were together. The jacket was found about six or seven miles away from where her car was found. The jacket had been placed there after the police's initial search. Unfortunately, the jacket yielded no further clues or evidence. On April 26, 1993, a month after Raina was last seen, a fisherman and his teenage daughter were at a pond off Range Road, north of Laporte, Indiana. The daughter was taking a stroll when she saw a pair of human legs in the water. She yelled for her father to come take a look. He went closer and determined that it was a female body in the water. Two logs were placed on top of her body. When police arrived at the scene, they noted that the unknown woman wore the same clothes that Reyna was last seen wearing before she disappeared. Despite the body's advanced state of decomposition, it was determined that she was Reyna Rison. This was no longer a missing persons case. No obvious wounds or signs of significant trauma were found on her body. Later, during the autopsy, it was concluded that Reyna had been strangled. With the discovery, investigators went back to Jason Tibbs to see if he knew anything. He told them about Ray McCarty. Ray was married to Reyna's older sister, Lori Rison. Ray had assaulted and impregnated Reyna when she was 11 and had been imprisoned for the crime. His probation ended only two months before Reyna went missing. You'd think Lori Rison would have divorced Ray for what he did, but no, they were still married. He clearly had a motive and was dangerous with a past criminal record targeted against Reyna. Investigators visited Ray and Lori's house. The couple told investigators that neither of them saw Reyna on the day she disappeared. Ray stated that he was busy shooting pigeons on a friend's farm that night. The detectives called the friend and he confirmed that Ray was indeed with him that night. Something didn't feel right to investigators, so they went to talk with Ray again. Ray talked to them alone and told them that he had seen Reyna on the night she vanished. He told them that he was house hunting on March 26, 1993. At about 5.40 p.m., he was gazing out the window of a house when he saw the animal hospital. He claimed he had just briefly seen Reyna at the parking lot of the animal hospital and asked if she knew where Lori was. He then left and picked up a female hitchhiker that night. Ray claimed the hitchhiker was the reason why he initially did not want to admit to having seen her. She did not fully trust him after what he did to her sister. Ray McCarty became the main suspect at this point, but there was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime and the case went cold. Unfortunately, the case remained cold for almost 18 months. It was then that Indiana State Police pulled over a van driven by Larry Hall. Hall would travel across the Midwest for Civil War and the Independence War reenactments. His van resembled one used in an attempted kidnapping. The police examined the van and discovered several items related to Reyna's case. In his van, he had newspaper clippings of Reyna and a prescription bottle with the name R. Rison on it. Larry claimed he was the one that abducted and slayed Reyna. He was then arrested. Detectives investigated his movements on the night of her disappearance and discovered that he was in Kentucky and the prescription bottle was a fake. Hall had falsely confessed to abducting and slaying around 50 other women. He seemed like the type of person who would insert himself into any investigation and confess. Larry Hall was subsequently ruled out as a suspect in Raina's case. 
He was not completely innocent, though. He was found guilty of taking 15-year-old Jessica Roach's life. I'll go over the case briefly at the end of the video for those interested. As for Raina's case, it remained cold until 1998. Investigators did not know what else they could do and looked at their initial suspects again. Matt Elser, Jason Tibbs, and Ray McCarty. Matt's alibi was solid, and investigators never really considered him a serious suspect. Jason's story of fox hunting wasn't that solid because no one actually saw him, but it seemed he was on good terms with Raina. Ray, on the other hand, lied about his alibi at first, and he was most definitely a horrible person, so investigators decided to focus on him. They got a warrant to search Ray's property. Inside his house, investigators found two handguns and a stun gun. They also discovered blood in his car's trunk, but were unable to determine its source. Ray McCarty was arrested in May 1998. He waited in jail for 15 months while the police continued to build their case against him. While Ray was in jail, a new prosecutor had been assigned. He was a hunter, and it was concluded that the blood belonged to a deer. The prosecutor felt that there was not enough evidence linking him to the crime, and they were forced to let him go again. He was released after a year in jail. For the next nine years, the case would once again be classified as a cold case, unfortunately. Then, in 2008, police got a lead that would blow this case wide open. They received a letter from an inmate serving a 44-year sentence. His name is Ricky Hammonds. He requested to talk with investigators. Ricky was in prison because he took his roommate's life. Ricky said he decided to come forward after thinking about his niece. He said he would want someone to come forward if anything had happened to her. This is everything he had to say. Back in 1993, when he was 14 years old, he was in the roof of a barn next to his parents' house smoking marijuana. He heard a car drive in the barn. Ricky saw his sister's boyfriend, Eric Feldman, and Jason Tibbs. They opened the trunk of his sister's sedan, and Ricky then saw a body covered by a blanket. Ricky could still make out the upper half of the victim. It was a female wearing a Leatherman jacket. He did not know it was Raina, but a couple of days later, when Raina's face appeared in the media, he realized who it was. Ricky said that he was scared to come forward back in 1993 because he was worried he would get into trouble for smoking marijuana. The police tracked Eric Fieldman down in South Carolina. He was visibly nervous. He did not want to speak to them and refused all interviews. Investigators then told him he will face no consequences if he can tell them exactly what happened with Raina. He accepted the deal and told them everything. Eric said that he and Jason were cruising in his girlfriend's sedan when they drove past the animal hospital on March 26, 1993. Jason wanted to get Raina to leave Matt and take him back. When she exited the animal hospital, he called her over to the car. She clearly did not want to talk to him. Before she could scream, he pushed her into the car and told Eric to drive away quickly. A couple minutes later, Eric stopped the car and Raina tried to run away. Jason followed her and said, If I can't have you, no one can. He then strangled her until she stopped breathing. Jason and Eric loaded Raina's body in the trunk and drove to the barn. That is where Ricky saw them. After much deliberation, Eric and Jason then decided to place Raina's body in the pond and weigh her down with logs. Eric drove Jason back to the clinic to pick up Raina's car. Jason abandoned the car. He also discarded Matt's jacket. In August 2013, 38-year-old Jason Tibbs was arrested and charged with taking Raina Rison's life. Twenty years had passed since Raina's life was ended. His trial started in late 2013. His defense argued that Ricky was not a trustworthy witness since he was a high school student at the time, 
and because he waited 15 years to come forward with the truth. In order to ensure that Eric Freeman testified truthfully in the trial, he was granted immunity from prosecution. After a lengthy trial that lasted until December 2014, Jason Tibbs was found guilty. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison with 20 years served. Outside the courtroom, Raina's family cried. They hugged each other and the prosecutor. The Rison family got some form of justice, but the daughter they'd lost in a crime of passion would never come back. Tibbs still claims that he is innocent and that Ray McCarty is responsible for what happened to Raina. Tibbs made numerous appeals to the Indiana Supreme Court after being shot down by the state's appellate court. On September 8, 2016, the Indiana Court of Appeals ruled against a request for a new trial by Jason Tibbs. As recently as 2018, his lawyers publicly stated that they are still fighting for his innocence. Raina was 16 years old and had her whole life ahead of her. She was finally happy again when she and Matt got back together. Unfortunately, it seems that she was surrounded by terrible people that let her down. As promised, I'll go over some of the details of Jessica Roach's case. 15-year-old Jessica lived in Georgetown, Illinois in 1993. She had dreams of one day being a pilot. On September 20th, 1993, Jessica Roach went outside to ride her new bicycle. Tragedy struck when Jessica's sister found the bike lying on the road, but Jessica was nowhere to be found. Her sister alerted their father, who contacted the police, but Jessica would never be seen alive again. Six weeks after she went missing, her remains were discovered in Perrysville, Indiana, which is close to the state's border. Her body was found by a farmer who made the discovery while using his combine. Jessica's body showed signs of having been there for some time. Due to the state of her remains, it was difficult for investigators to learn more about when, how, or where she lost her life. Police found suspect Larry Hall about a year later when he began trailing a pair of girls. The girls reported him to the police and provided investigators with Hall's license plate number. When he was brought in for police questioning and shown a photo of Jessica, Hall apparently flinched and covered his face before denying that he'd ever seen her. A confession eventually did trickle out, with Hall telling police that he tied her up but couldn't remember what he used. He then said that he removed her clothing, assaulted her, and strangled her against a tree with his belt. Hall also provided vague descriptions of other young girls he'd abused. I picked up several girls in other areas, but I can't remember which ones I hurt, he told police. Investigators determined that he was falsely confessing to a lot of crimes, but that he did indeed take Jessica's life. Hall was given a life sentence with no possibility of parole. He is currently incarcerated at a medium security prison in North Carolina. Jessica Roach's loved ones held benefits in past years in her memory, and in 2015, they created a scholarship in her name. The previous news segment concludes the program of 24 Hours Channel. Thank you all for your attention and viewership. Please leave your feedback in the comment section of this video so that we can timeline respond and address any question you may have. If you find it interesting, please like and click the bell icon below to not miss the last video from our editorial team. Goodbye and see you in the next news update from 24 Hours Channel.